Before we start, Degenerates. I hope you've already bought the new edition of Skyrim and made Todd happy. You can now watch the evolution of The Elder Scrolls, the game series that gives you almost unlimited freedom and unlimited memes. Before 1994, Bethesda was a pretty unremarkable studio, mostly made mediocre sports sims and movie licensed games. The first part of the TES series, The Elder Scrolls Arena, was designed as a gladiator fight simulator. However, there's actually no arena in the game. During the development, Bethesda realized they'd much rather make an RPG with an open world and side quests than a linear game about a traveling gladiator. Ultima Underworld, released in 1992, became the reference point and a source of inspiration. The game's release was a failure, though. Only 3,000 copies were sold initially, and it seemed like that would be the end of it. But then you had some positive reviews from critics, and gamers played their part, and the sales began to rise. The game was praised for its huge world, numerous quests, the graphics, and the combat, but it was also criticized for the obscure plot and ridiculous amount of bugs. So get this, it was rumored that the game was tested by just two people, and it sure as hell seemed that way. Now, despite all the issues, enough copies of the game were sold to cover the development. TES Arena introduced many key features for the series. The nameless prisoner hero, the fundamentals of the lore, the names of the provinces, and the high level of freedom. It did not become a bestseller, but a cult classic? Yeah. The Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall also became known as Buggerfall. It's still the biggest game in the series. Arena was bigger, its map is said to be between 6 and 9 million square kilometers, but there's actually no way to verify that since you can't travel across the whole map, only fast travel. Once you exit a town, the game starts to glitch and then inevitably crashes. So it's a bit of a Schrodinger's map, it's both vast and very limited. As for Daggerfall, its map consists of 15,000 locations, 750,000 characters, and an area of 210,000 square kilometers. So for some additional context, that's almost the size of real-life Great Britain. However, most of the wastelands, forests, towns, and villages and dungeons outside the main quest were randomly generated, which is why they were usually nearly identical. The development of Daggerfall began right after the release of Arena, and it was this game that finalized the identity of the series. It introduced the role-playing system in which the skills leveled up as you used them. The plot was no longer just a bunch of unrelated stories. The main factions and the reputation system were introduced. I mean, heck, even the NPCs started to feel like people that you could actually talk to, and of course the freedom. The player could now create their own class for the character and even create custom-made spells. The game's extreme difficulty also remained. Leaving the first dungeon was a test not everyone could pass. And the bugs only added to the difficulty. The devs released patches, the community made their own, but many problems remained unsolved. Completing Daggerfall is a rare achievement. The game has six endings, all of which are considered canon, but few people have seen them all. After the enormous Daggerfall, the next game was the linear and Elder Scrolls legend, Battlespire. Initially, the game was supposed to just be an expansion, but during the course of development, it transformed into a spin-off. The player only had seven linear levels, and there was no freedom at all. But there was a competitive multiplayer and co-op instead. A little later, The Elder Scrolls Adventures Redguard came out. It was the first game in the series where the development was led by Todd Howard. With Daggerfall, he only assisted with the game design. And Todd's first attempt was not all that successful. The predetermined protagonist, the third-person view, and no role-playing. This was not what the fans wanted. Redguard and Battlespire sold really poorly. The company was on the verge of bankruptcy. I mean, they desperately needed a new hit RPG. The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind became just that. After the spin-off's failure, the game's concept was revised several times. The devs ended up giving up on the enormous scale and the random generation. The game took place in just one province, so the map shrunk to just 0.01% of Daggerfall's size. Every town and every dungeon was now handcrafted. This allowed Morrowind to have its own unique style. Countless randomly generated quests were also replaced with pre-written ones. This game ended up receiving two expansions, Tribunal and Blood Moon, and most importantly, a mod editor called the Elder Scrolls Construction Set. It allowed the players to change almost any aspect of the game. The players could create new armor and weapons, change textures, or make total conversions that turned TES into Fallout years before Bethesda did. The editor actually increased the game's lifespan, and the user mods became an essential part of the series. Thanks to its atmosphere and detailed world, many still consider Morrowind to be the best game in the series although it might be due to the TES unwritten rule. Usually, the best game in the series is the one that you played first. And for many, Morrowind was the first, especially console players that could experience the Elder Scrolls starting with this game. 
Between the third and fourth mainline games, there were several mobile titles, uh, but let's not talk about those. There is nothing memorable about them, except the fact that they visually look like the first two games. Three years later, Bethesda began to prepare for the release of The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. The studio published a big chunk of gameplay while Todd Howard started doing interviews and telling stories about the upcoming project. And this is where Todd seemed to turn into the new Peter Molyneux. He was spreading exciting lies about where the game would be, and almost none of them turned out to be true. They didn't have the time to implement the promised mounted combat, although horses were kept as a way of fast travel. Full-scale armor and weapon crafting was also gone. Even in-game shadows disappeared before the release. But all of that was nothing compared to the promises of the NPC AI. According to Todd, the Oblivion characters were supposed to live their lives to the fullest, have their own schedules and errands, motivations and needs. They were also supposed to react to the player's actions, weather or bandit attacks. Yeah, it didn't exactly work out. The game's radiant AI was pretty groundbreaking, but the NPCs would still often space out and just stand in one place for days instead of doing what they were supposed to do. Apart from big expansions, which these days would qualify as separate games, TES4 received minor DLCs. The most infamous, a horse armor set that cost $2.50 and became a meme and an example of poor implementation of microtransactions. And then there was a character creation tool that would only create awful creeps no matter how hard you tried. But all that noted, it didn't make Oblivion a bad game. It was another successful release. It's just that Oblivion came out between two cult classics, which largely outshined it. What can we tell you about The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim? Everyone knows it anyway. Game turned 10 this year, came out on three generations of consoles, and it feels like it's always been out there. I mean, it's an immortal classic and a meme game. Bye Skyrim! Arrow to the knee! Fus Roda! The giants that can send you into space with one punch! Yeah, these are all things that several generations of gamers will never forget. As for the game itself, do we even need to say it was a success? Because of course it was. The devs thought, eh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and only made minor changes to their formula. They added the ability to combine different weapons and spells for each hand. The role-playing system was slightly changed. You still needed to use each skill to level up, but could also choose from a constellation of skills for a more finely tuned build. There were no classes, and you could create any character, but still mostly ended up with a stealthy archer type. The environment also changed. After the psychedelic Morrowind and fantasy-like Oblivion, it was time for the almost monochrome Skyrim with its vast snow-covered expanses. Apart from that, it was exactly the adventure the fans had been waiting for. A sandbox RPG where few reach the main story's ending since there are so many other fun distractions. Skyrim probably only had one serious flaw, its quests. First of all, it introduced the randomly generated assignments that added nothing to the lore and the story and only dragged out the game. Yeah, they masquerade as regular quests at first, but after being sent to deal with some bandits or retrieve an object for the tenth time, you start to suspect something. Hey, maybe you don't like Skyrim, maybe you're avoiding Skyrim at all costs, but sooner or later you'll feel the urge to play Skyrim one more time. Or better still, buy another copy. The Elder Scrolls Online MMORPG was in development for seven years. However, this did not save it from problems at launch. Upon release, it turned out that some exploits allowed the players to duplicate items. The price of the subscription was also something the players began to complain about. In less than a year, the mandatory monthly subscription was replaced by an optional one, ESO+. It also gave access to expansions, in-game currency, and made the progress faster. The Elder Scrolls Online receives regular updates adding new parts to Tamriel provinces. The game's doing well, but as it's often the case with multiplayer spin-offs of single-player games, it's still polarizing. TES Online has plenty of content for a solo player, but some might find it hard to feel like a heroic savior of the world with a dozen other chosen ones running around. Inspired by Hearthstone's success, Bethesda released their own card game, The Elder Scrolls Legends. In the mid and late 2010s, everyone was trying to release their own collectible card game. You live on to this day, and Legends is not one of them. The game had an interesting mechanic with two lanes and a focus on a single player rather than PvP, but that didn't really help. Although Legends is still functional, Bethesda ceased its support a few years ago. The Elder Scrolls Blades was presented as a full-scale TES mobile game. Well, that's obviously a lie. Blades is a typical mobile grinder with loot boxes, farming elements, and microtransactions. Now, all we know about The Elder Scrolls VI comes from a 30-second teaser. And that's really enough for the fans to start making theories. But all I can tell you, it's still a ways away from release. 2024, if I'm being optimistic. And while we're waiting for more news, 
Write down in the comments which part of TES is your favorite. Psst, and tell us why it's Morrowind. This has been Hello Arcade. Hit the like, ring the bell, subscribe for more. We'll see you in the next one.